Hey everyone. Hello? Hello? Hello. Hey everyone, how's it going? How is it going? Um Welcome to the second stream of this look back at the end of the sh of the um Showa era and the beginning of the Heisei era like in terms of released video games um as we were doing yesterday um well, so if you weren't with us yesterday um what we were doing was uh essentially looking back at around the time um around the time the Showa era of um, Japanese history ended around like the beginning of 1989 and seeing like what games were out around that time um, because uh, this Wednesday or really today as far as like Japanese time goes um, the current emperor um, who is historically significant because he's like the first emperor to officially be like just a state head because he he's, he was like the first emperor to assume the throne um, post World War Two um, and this is also like the first emperor to abdicate the throne um, like of his own volition which they actually had to change around a few laws to allow him to do. Um, he announced his him ending his tenure in office uh, about three years ago because of concerns of ailing health. So um, yeah, he'll if he'll um, officially be stepping down um, this Wednesday or today as far as Japanese time goes. It's officially April 1st, so officially tomorrow. Um, but what I thought would be cool to do is to kind of look at where console games are... Um, well, where console games were back when he first assumed the throne... Um, when the Showa era ended and the current Heisei era began, which was officially January 7th, 1989. So, um, if you're not in the know, uh, there were, a, there were about, uh, there were quite a few home console systems out on the market at that time. Um, you had your Nintendo Entertainment System, or the Family Computer, as it was called in Japan. Um, Nintendo's system, and by far the most popular. You had um, Sega's Master System, or the Mark III, as it was originally called in Japan. That was actually on its way out, um, and they had just introduced their um, Sega Mega Drive, or as we call it in the States, the Genesis. Um, and then there was, um, Nippon Electric's, uh, PC Engine, um, and we know that in the States as a TurboGrafx-16. Um, that was notable for being one of the first systems to have a CD add-on, and last night we got to look at one of the first CD games ever released, and it's crap. Um... So t tonight we're going to be looking at, um, we're not going to be looking at as many games, but um, we're probably going to be playing them for a little bit longer. A lot of them are a bit better than some of the stuff that we saw last night. Um, now there wasn't, like, once the old Emperor died and the new Emperor stepped up, obviously, like, game design like didn't radically change after that event so um really like the gaming zeitgeist hadn't really changed because of this like 
monumental event in Japanese history. But, like, really, this is just a continuation of, like, looking back at how games were back in the day, and how far they've come since. Um, so, yeah. Last night we got to, we got to look at um, a pretty obscure version of Tetris, Mega Man 2, Super Mario Bros. 3, like, some of the two of the biggest games on the Nintendo Entertainment System, as well as, like, some of the first games to be released on the on the Genesis, like Space Harrier 2 and Altered Beast. Um, there's also a couple of really good games for the PC Engine, and of course um, the CD game that I mentioned before, um, Fighting Street, or it, it's really just a port of the first Street Fighter. But that archive's up on YouTube if you want to look at it. I think it's about time to actually get started up with these games. Um, so our first game uh, that we're going to be looking at today came out on this February 4th, 1989. Um, this would have been maybe about a week after the beginning of the Heisei era. Um, and... It's going to be on a console that I hadn't actually pulled up before. So hopefully this isn't going to look too bad. Where is it? There we go. Do -do -do. Let me just change the box here. Goodness, I forgot to even... <laughs> I forgot to introduce myself. Um, just in case... Just in case you didn't already know... Um, my name is Zilaz. Pronouns she, her, or, or they, them. Either's fine. Um, and, yeah. Our first game of the night will be... Sega's Bomber Raid. Notable for being the final... Um, the final Master System game released for for the the final Master System game released for Japanese um, stores, like this was maybe a few months after they had come out with the Mega Drive. So, like right after the release of the Mega Drive, Sega of Japan was just like. They just kind of noped the fuck right out of the Master System, which really didn't have much of a market share in Japan, or in the States for that matter. Um, it did get a lot of traction in like Brazil and Europe though. So anyway, let's go ahead and jump right in. As the demo mode might have shown, this is a, a shoot 'em up. And it is kind of hard to see bullets in this. Also, some of the power-ups apparently kill you. For those familiar with the Master System and are probably thinking, like, this... For a Master System game, this doesn't really sound like a master system, it's because um, I'm using... the emulation for this game is using the um, FM synthesis chip that was included in um, certain versions of the Japanese master system, and was an add-on for um, the original Sega Mark III. It never came out in the States, although this game did, so when this game came out in the States, um, it actually had a more primitive sound to it. We'll be looking at like the game without the FM sound um, here in a bit. Like 
but otherwise, but aside from like this difference in music, this is pretty much identical in all in all the regions it was released in. So, even though this was released, even though this was released like almost 30 years ago, this this game probably would have been pretty uh, primitive, even for its time. Like, this came out after stuff like, um, after stuff like Gra Gradius, or an R-Type. Stuff that had, like, very robust um, power-up systems and level design. Oh, goodness. And this game kind of doesn't have any of that. It's it's your bog standard military theme. Shoot 'em up with kind of really hard to like with some with a few questionable design design decisions. Um, like Sega released another shmup shoot 'em up for the console around, like, 1986, called, uh, Astro Warrior, and it plays almost, no, it plays kind of like this, um, except it's, like, space-themed, and, in my opinion, is a superior shooter to this, so... You could probably argue that Sega didn't have like their best guys on on the development staff for this game. <sighs> I swear I can at least get to the second level usually with games like these. Well, with this game in particular. Fortunately, um, I can't think of any, like, can't really think of any Master System first-party controllers that had, like, a auto-fire, which this game probably really could have used, because having to continually mash... Kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah, there really isn't a lot to say for this game, except for the fact that this was the last Japanese Master System game. Um, the Master System would go on, uh, like, a quite a long time um, after after this game, though, in, like, Europe and Brazil, as mentioned before, and, like, there were a, a lot of games released, at, like, after this game, and in fact, I'd, I'd go as far as to say that the Sega Master System's best games came out after this, like, the Sega Master System got a pretty unique and, I'd say, decent board of, uh, well, adaptation, more like, um, wasn't really a straight port of um, the first Sonic the Hedgehog. It also got a. It also got like. It also got a pretty interesting reinterpretation of games like Streets of Rage uh, one and two, um, which are distinct from the. Which are distinct from like the the Game Gear versions, which if you don't know, the Sega Game Gear, a um, portable competitor to the Nintendo Game Boy, had very similar hardware to the uh, Master System, but it had a smaller screen. Um, like, the hardware was so similar, you could actually use a, an adapter to play 
Sega Master System games on on a Game Gear, and the Game Gear had a video mode where it would display um, Master System games in like its full resolution at the cost of like color depth, because the Se the Sega um, the Sega Game Gear could display more colors, but it couldn't do so at like like it had a smaller um, resolution for that for that mode. Oh goodness, I think I'm a little too fast. Um, but anyway, um, so not only did it get ports of the, not only did it get those games, but it got like quite a few of original Sonic the Hedgehog games. Um, I think it got like official ports of. Street Fighter 2 and like at least Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, which is pretty crazy. Um, I want to say Brazil even got like what? Um, oh goodness, oh goodness, why is it slowing down? Better just use bombs. <laughs> um, yeah, Brazil supported the Master System well into the two thousands with like smaller models and even a model that used uh, an RF signal to like allow for wireless controllers. It, it's pretty crazy what some um, regions of the world were able to do with this with this system. Even though Japan and um, America kind of weren't really on board with it. I was gonna say, I I kind of like the fact that most enemies die in one hit, but now that we're getting ground-based popcorn enemies that take a few more hits to kill, like, it's it's really... it's really not very great um, with a, for a game that just doesn't have any auto-fire. I mean, I can't imagine anyone with, like, an actual, um, Master System controller having to mash like this to, like, to play this game, because the Sega Master System controller, if you don't know, um, it kind of looks like a, a Nintendo, like an NES controller, but the buttons are way mashier, and the D-pad is, like, absolute, it's like horseshit. Um, but anyway, yeah, having to mash on a controller button like that would have just been unbearable. Like, I've tried playing Astro Warrior on a, on an, uh, Master System controller, and it was, it's just painful. Um, luckily though, you can actually hook up a Sega Genesis controller to master systems and just use those and those are just way more comfortable than master system controllers I'm doing unusually well Honestly, I don't think I've ever really seen past um, the second stage of this game. Um, and from everything I've seen of this game, it seems to be the usual bog standard Pacific, like almost World War II um, aesthetic. Like this kind of looks like 
this kind of just looks more like a more colorful um, 1982. Though, I've got to admit, though, um, being able to respawn like immediately after dying is pretty great. It's not really something you'd see a lot in shmups at the time. Um, so, I mean, that's one point in this game's favor, I guess. This game isn't all that bad, um, aside from the, some of the bullets maybe being a little too hard to see. It's kind of weird. Another thing that's kind of interesting about this game is that this isn't actually a, a port of any of Sega's arcade games. This is a, like a Master System original. Um, and a lot of Sega's output for the system by this point what were just like ports of arcade games, so... Console originals for the Master System, for the Japanese Master System, were vi you didn't see a lot of them. Um, not at all. Oh, now we've got lava. One game I didn't actually show off last night was a game for the Turbo Graphics called um, Dragon Spirit, which kind of featured a lot of jungle and lava areas. It's it's a little more complex than this game. There's actually like you actually have to shoot at things in the sky and then bomb things with your dragon. Yes, bomb things with your dragon. Um, on the ground. Um, but yeah, you were all, you were actually fighting like monsters and other fantasy stuff in, in that game. And that game is like it's. I don't really think it's as good as this game, really. But that's less because of like how it's. It's a game I want to like, but it's because of like how big your hitbox is in that game. It, it just has a lot of little flaws that make it really unpleasant to play. Um, Dragon Spirit did later get a um, an, an NES pseudo sequel that's way more playable though. Ooh, little baby tank. That was actually kind of fun. <laughs> I'm not gonna even lie. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the game without the enhanced sound chip of the Japanese console and kind of see how it would have sounded. Um, how it would have sounded in on like U.S. Con consoles. Um, okay. Give me one moment. And then reboot core. There we go. So the music is a little bit louder and a bit. a bit more uh, simplistic, I guess you could say, but 
It might be a little more nostalgic to those who actually had a Sega Master System back in the day. You gotta like like the sound of those explosions, though. It's a, they're a lot more crunchy I, than the FM synthesis version, I think. Really, the Sega Master System's FM synthesis is a bit divisive among Master System fans. Like, some people actually like the more simplistic um, square tones generated by the generated by like the stock hardware than like some of the softer tones of the FM synthesis. I'm more of an FM synthesis sort of guy, but like I I can definitely I can definitely see the appeal of games that sound like this. <sighs> like in some ways it sounds actually more primitive than even the NES. But even still, it's just it's 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 loud and crunchy and it it's it is certainly an acquired taste for sure, I guess. I'm not doing so good. <laughs> I gotta say though, something about something about this version of the soundtrack makes it sound more happy, more more jovial even. gonna go ahead and switch over to our next game. Um, because I think I've shown off enough of Bomber Raid for now. Um, but it's actually... It, if you're looking for something to play on the Master System, like if you're just getting into the Master System's catalog, um, this isn't an unpleasant game to play. Um, and you can certainly do worse as far as like shoot 'em ups go. So anyway, um, about about five days after this, um, on April, oh, sorry, on February 9th, nineteen eighty nine, a game came out for the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics. Um, one that a lot of, like, TurboGrafx fans seem to really like, and certainly a game that, like, if you're a fan of the Advance Wars series, um, I've heard th this game is very much up, like, those fans' alleys, but I don't know if that really made sense. Um, it's a little game called... One well, Japan was called Nectaris, but in America it got the name of Military Madness, which I think kind of expresses the point of the game a little clear more clearly, even though it's not really as cool sounding as Nectaris, I think. We have some backstory. Or 
most powerful nations. Finally, on April 6, 2089, the Axis of Empires army launches an all-out attack and captures most of the moon. All innocent people must now fight or perish. The Axis army now occupies most of the moon's fa factories where they are continually producing new weapons for their secret assault on planet Earth. The Axis secret police have rounded up many members of the Allied Powers and put them in prisons. Without their key people, the Allied Powers stand little chance. Meanwhile, the Axis Empire draws closer to launching their SAM, or Supreme Atomic Missile, the weapon that will, they will use to destroy the Earth. The Allied Powers know, know they must free their prisoners if they can stand a chance to stop the SAM before launch time. You must free the prisoners and stop this military madness, title drop, and their secret weapon SAM and destroy the Earth in... I think I misread that. So, this game actually comes with a, an in-game manual. Kind of explaining how the game goes. Like, in-game manual, um, content like this is is really something you hardly ever saw in video games at the time. Um, and, like, visuals showing how the game is played was something, like, you almost never saw in video games. So this was, this was pretty unusual for a game. So, here, let's go ahead and show off the game. Oh, you can even select the manual from the main menu. stage we can select right now. So this game seems to be based off of, like, older um, strategy games for computers at the time. Although, they start you off on, on like, a... It looks like they start you off on a map that is just this small. So, this game seems to be just from the looks of it, seems to be geared towards console players probably not so familiar with this kind of game. So, I think our base. Can't really do with anything with it. So we got eight Charlies here um, on each of these unit things, and eight Bisons, which I guess these are these tank things. So what we gotta do is, assuming we're the blue guys, we gotta go in and kill these green guys and take their take their stuff. So I guess shift means. So used to like selecting units and seeing like how where they can move, kind of like in Fire Emblem. Um, but anyway, let's see. Let's shift this guy. He might actually benefit from the terrain. And then let's shift our tanks over towards this more empty, this more clear terrain, because they can take more of a beating than our, our personnel units. Let's go 
go ahead and move Charlie here over here. And then let's end this turn. So there seems to be this this gulf over here that I can't get my tanks over, which I guess is how what the Charlies here are for. So let's go ahead and use the tank here to attack this personal. What? To attack this personal unit here. have three units left, so they're... They are not looking too good. Let's shift this unit over here. And... Oh, attack this guy over here. So since they're evenly matched, they both lost the same amount of units. But if I move this guy over here, I should be able to attack this guy. Hmm, so I haven't quite wiped them up just yet. I can shift this... I can shift this guy over here. Um, but then I'd have them open to attack by those tanks. But they might also be... <sighs> they might also be protected by the terrain. Though, you know, I could actually move them over here and have them kind of cross this mountainous terrain right into their base, which is being not really well protected right now, and then leave these tanks he <clears throat> here to do the bulk of the offensive work. See how well that goes. they can't win. So then I'll just go ahead and ship them right over here. I can't actually get to the base yet, so I'm gonna take it slow. the end of that unit's life. Looks like we're winning. Ooh, and I can move this guy right in here.
let's go ahead and have him attack Charlie, because if we attack the Bison, we'll, we'll inevitably lose more units. Oh, we can't even go in to provide backup, so... Just go ahead and just end their turn right there. taken too too kindly to our our attempted sneak attack And that's the end of that first map. This is... Goodness, this is a little more... say, um, more accessible than I thought it'd be. Like, this is... So I've played old games like this before, stuff like Game Boy Wars, which is like, kind of the ancient, um, predecessor to stuff like Advanced Wars, and, like, this game is a whole lot easier than, than that. Or Famicom Wars, or um, like Dyson Ryaku, which is like a really ancient series of military simulation games that kind of play like this. But yeah, um, so this is Military Madness. Uh, I think I've shown off enough of this game for now. Um, I will definitely be looking into this game more in the future, because this looks really good. Alright, so let's go ahead and move on to our next game. It's going to be another one from um, February of 89, coming out the day after this for the Sega Mega Drive, or the Sega Genesis if you prefer. Um, it's going to be 
one of those platformer games that were such so popular at the time. Um, though, I gotta say, it's not quite as good as the likes of Super Mario Bros. 3. So, back before Sonic was released in 1991, um, Sega wanted a mascot to compete against uh, to compete against Mario. So, in response, they re made their own character called Alex Kidd, which was this guy who could punch stuff and had really killer sideburns. Um, also, he has a thing for paper, rock, scissors for whatever reason. Um, his first game was on that was actually on the Master System, and that was like one of that system's better platformer games. Although, to be honest, it's not really that great. <laughs> um, but this is the sequel to that game. Um, that game being Alex Kidd in I think Miracle World, and this game being Alex Kidd in. The Enchanted Castle. So let's go ahead and... Um... Goodness, I think I don't have the controller set up. Let's go ahead and start this up. So it's definitely pretty colorful. Um, so there's apparently shops in this game, but instead of... Well, no, you still buy stuff with currency, but instead of just letting you buy stuff, like... You also gotta win at rock, paper, scissors. And if you don't win at rock, paper, scissors, you'll actually just die. I think you'll lose your currency and you'll just die. Um, it's. It's kind of frustrating. Plus, you also get this jump kick, which does damage, but it's kind of wonky in how it's, like, activated. Sometimes it doesn't really hit things you want them to. And this isn't... Like, they give you this jump kick because you can't really punch in midair, which is really kind of irritating. So that was the end of the first level. Not much to say there. Now, you, there's also like a there's a variety of items you can get in this game. Like there aren't any power-up blocks that you can break open and get power-ups from. You're essentially going to have to buy all your power-ups, except for the rare occasion where you'll find one like out in the open. You got this. Uh, bracelet that lets you shoot power beams when you punch, and you got this, um, motorcycle thing that is pretty excellent for speedruns. Not that I would know anything about that. Um, but it's also incredibly fragile. If you hit, like, hitting that those orange blocks right there kind of wrecked my bike, and now I don't have a bike anymore. Um, and I'm gonna have to go and get another bike, which kind of sucks. Like, there isn't really a, a world map or much variance in the levels. 
um, like, each level does, like, have its own theme. Um, like, there's only one prairie level, there's only one, un like, water-based level like this. Um, there are actually two town-based levels. So, like, each level is pretty unique, but gameplay for is pretty much the same. Like, you're having to go from left to right and having to deal with uh, sort of dodgy hit detection in this game. It's... People tend to consider this game, like, worse than even the Alex Kidd in Miracle World, like, prequel for the Master System, and I'm kind of inclined to agree. Um, for as bad as that game is, things are just a bit more awkward and worse in this game. And the game itself isn't all that long. It, there's only about 12 of these levels, and none of them are much longer, like the stages aren't really much longer than what we've seen already, with the exception of um, the titular Enchanted Castle, which is just this huge multi-screen labyrinth, which is just very irritating to get through. Um, and even more irritating to try, try and speedrun. Again, not like I really know anything about that, though. <laughs> um, and if you can't already tell, like, controls in this game are a little slippery. Like, Alex Kidd has quite a bit of momentum to him. Like, he kind of slides around. Um, and when he's out up in the air, uh, oh shoot, there's your bombs. Those will kill you dead. Um, what was I saying? I'm kind of blanking it on here. Um, but, yeah, this is not that great a game. I think that was a, a camel. Now, we haven't even gotten into, like, one of the most aggravating parts of this game, though. Um, the boss fights. Oh, goodness. I mean, the platforming's pretty aggravating as it is, honestly. Um, God. And that was game over. So, okay. I'm not actually gonna... Here, there's actually a option in the options that I can show you. Um, go to Jenkin. You got the Gorilla, the Queen, the Bear, and the Wizard. These four are, like, four of the five bosses in the game. Um, and bosses go pretty much like, like, the merchant exchanges in the game, where you against, you go against, you go against the, um, boss in a rock paper scissors match and if you lose you die and if you win you get to go on and that's that's really it like there's no there's not really any skill to it it's just knowing how the game's rng works which is its own kind of awkward thing um, so, that is Alex Kid in the Enchanted Castle. Not really recommended. Um, so, released about a month and change after this for the Mega Drive is a game that is way more liked and well regarded. Um, and one that I can actually kind of recommend with a pretty big asterisk, which we'll get into in a second. Um, back in 1987, um, the Sega Mega Drive got 
a pretty monumental game called Fantasy Star, which had, which was an RPG. Really, it was released like right around the same time as the first Final Fantasy. Um, and like in my opinion, it's actually a bit better than that game. But um, Fantasy Star Two came out on the twenty first of March of eighty nine. Marking I th what I think is perhaps the first 16 bit um, JRPG to come out in the Heisei era. And I think this is actually a pretty good example of like where console RPGs were at this time. That's pretty big. Let's go ahead and downsize that a bit. So, this takes place about a thousand years after the first game, so you don't really need to know, like, the... You don't really need to know, like, what goes down, what went down back then, because... I mean, there are a few references to the events of the first game, but it's pretty insubstantial overall. So let's go ahead and start up the game. Looks like I have a... I have save data, but... Oops, that's not the right button. But we're not gonna go into that. We're gonna start ourselves a new game. And... begin the game. I'm haunted by nightmares every night. A young girl is battling a giant demon. I'm close by but can't move or speak. All I can do is watch while the demon keeps striking at the girl. Just as she's fighting for her life, I awake. I awake in my room, did dimly lit by the early dawn. I am filled with an incredible sadness and fear. I am Zalaz, an agent here in Paseo, the capital of Motabia. I shake my head as if to scatter the remnants of the dream. I have no time to worry like a child about nightmares in this modern age, especially with the mother brain planning and controlling all aspects of the environment. That can't, nothing can go wrong from that. I open my window and take a deep breath of fresh air. It seems to wash away the bad feelings left by my dream. Man, I used to think this was like the pinnacle of video game writing back when I was, what, 10 or 12, when I first played this on, like, my dad's um, Windows Millennium Edition computer, like when this was on uh, the original Sega Smash Pack, which was just a bunch of, which was essentially a bunch of Sega ROMs um, slapped together on a, on a disc. But I didn't know that back then. I, th I just knew that this was a pretty cool looking old game. Anyway, good morning Agent Zalaz. How are you doing? You have been working for my department nearly two years now. The assignment I am about to give you is of great importance, and as it decides the fate of our planet. As you already know, the computer mother brain developed the solar system. As the head of the development plan, I was ordered to study mother brain's progress. I have to believe that what it does is the work of God. Oh, I think this is the retranslation that I downloaded a long time ago. Um, anyway, um, however, I'm starting to become suspicious as these biological monsters are appearing on our planet. Oh no. Why were they created? And how do we stop them? Is there really a reason? Does it, there always have to be a reason? Your mission is to break into the biosystems of the mother brain and take the flight recorder there. If we analyze it, we may know why the biosystem made these monsters. I wish you luck and hope to see you back alive, Agent Zalaz. So let's go ahead and... This is all automated, by the way. So after going home and preparing for the trip, Nay seems worried. Nay, be good while I'm gone, okay? 
Nay stared at me for a while. She had the same face when I rescued her seven months ago. Nay was created by combining bio-monster and human cells. Why would you do that? People hated and despised her, and she was about to be killed. However, I rescued and ra then raised her. You were young when I rescued you, but you can live on your own now, right? My journey could be hazardous, and I don't want you to be in danger. You are a great sister, but I must go. Even my comfort, Nay still stood blocking my path. Zillaz, please take, please take me with you. For you, I would do anything. I stood up, but Nay continued to block my path, so I decided to take her with me. Nothing could ever go wrong from that. And then the game actually begins proper. Um, got a menu here. Um, a search button there. Probably gonna need to maybe equip some stuff. Well, no, we actually start off with like a a knife, a carbon suit, and some shoes. Um, Nate doesn't really have a job or any weapons, so we might want to might want to change that before we got and throw it out into the fighting. So. Nay, being a cat girl, is going to want some steel claws. Yeah, this is definitely the retranslation. The original English translation for this game translated claws as bars for some reason, so even though Nay's attack animation clearly shows her... Well, you'll see. You'll see. Um... So let's go ahead and get her equipped with that claw. We can go ahead and... We might be able to buy another claw and have her... Clawing it up. So those who are, like, in touch with, um, like, those who are, like, in the know for, um, like, MMORPGs might recognize the Fantasy Star name. Um, so after the Fantasy Star series of four games concluded on the Genesis, um, on the Dreamcast, um, they reused the name for their Dreamcast MMORPG back in like 2000 and had it called Fantasy Star Online, and it was like a major success. Um, so I had to order me to attack. Um, and then after that, it's just been like MMORPG. G's with the Fantasy Star name, like there was Fantasy Star Universe and Fantasy Star Online 2. So, a weird thing about this battle system is that you, you're not always having to tell your party members to attack. You just give them orders and then like get the fight option, and then the the game, the battle just kind of pro progresses. Automatically. Um, it's a game with, like... It's a game with, like, default auto-battle, I guess you could say. Um, and, like, the, lay the layout of this world map is a kind of... Kind of odd for the time. Um, you don't get a lot of open space. You're kind of railroaded into different areas. Which, I mean, you kind of are in other games, too, but it's it's not as obvious as, like, in a Dragon Quest game of this, of this era. So, this is a game is actually pretty infamous for being pretty difficult. Um, I'm 
probably not going to be able to show it just now, but um, this game has really huge dungeons that are sprawling and like, oh dear, we can't, we can't go here. That aren't really, e that are really difficult to map out, like on graph paper or anything. Um, and they're chock full of like in random encounters, a lot of which, when you first encounter a dungeon, can pretty easily wipe your party. Um, does Nay have her healing magic yet? Okay, yeah, we're gonna need to heal her up. Because in the beginning, um, these mosquitoes are kind of a pain to deal with. Let's go ahead and have her heal the laws. things about Nay is even though she starts off weaker than than the main character here, um, she gains levels a lot quicker than a lot of the other characters, which tend to show up every now and then at the at the main player's um, house. Like every now and then, you'll have to check into your house and you'll see that someone has like stayed. At there, waiting for you, and that's kind of how you, that's kind of how you get, uh, new, looking out, um, new party members. So this is the clone labs, this is kind of where you get, um, down party members back. Um, like when you die in this game, just die. Um, it doesn't say that you fainted or anything. It, it just says you you died. Um, and so you have to have your body cloned and brought back, which is pretty unique for like a game of this time. And then you got your hospital here. Not really all you can do there. Um, So, to re really to progress much further than this, I'd have to sit down and grind for some of the more effective weapons over here, um, which would require like quite a bit of grinding, which makes this game um, pretty inaccessible nowadays, but I mean... It's, if you can get past the grinding, or if you can find, like, ROM patches um, to ease the difficulty, or um, if Sega deems it necessary to release this game on the Switch with, like, accessibility options, kind of like what they did with the first Fantasy Star, um, I would definitely check out this game. So, so we're going to go ahead and go into something that released one month after this for our last game. Um, it, so, April 21st, 1989, um, a little thing called the Nintendo Game Boy came out um, in Japan. And this was monumental because this was well, this was like one of the first um, handheld systems to use like interchangeable cartridges. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the first. Um, and the games on it were a lot more complex than some of the LCD games that were out at that time. Um, and one of those games was a little thing called Super Mario Land.
Now anyone who's familiar with this game might notice a few differences with this version. Um, game Boy games, as you know, originally were black and white. Well, for like the 30th anniversary of the Game Boy and this game, um, it, a pretty ingenious hacker went and made a DX version of this game that runs on Game Boy Color hardware, which is why everything is in color. So I thought I'd, for our last game, I'd maybe show off this this version of the game. I mean, this isn't quite what you would have seen on a handheld system back in 1989. Um, but... I mean, it wouldn't have been much different from this. Like, it would have just been this in black and white. Which, in 1989, would have been... pretty crazy. You may notice the... like, Mario kind of moves a, Like, everything looks a lot... looks pretty weird. Like, if you were to compare this to, say, Super Mario Bros. 3, and it certainly feels weird compared to that game. Like, Mario feels a lot... jankier. I'm not really sure how else to really say it. Like, this game just feels a lot more janky. Like, this doesn't even have Fire Mario. It has these things called Power Balls, where you shoot bouncing balls. Really, this game was um, developed by the team that would... that did... Um, like, did the earlier... <clears throat> sorry. Did the earlier arcade Mario games, as opposed to, like, Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Brothers 3. So, like, it... It really is kind of an oddball Mario game, and some people really don't like it for that, but I'm... Oh, that was... I should have gotten that. But I actually, like, really like this game. Um, I had it as a kid. Um, not when it was released, mine. I mean, I, this this would have come out years before I was born. Um, but I remember I had a copy of... I had somehow ended up with a copy of um, Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku for Game Boy Advance well before I had a Game Boy Advance, and I had a friend in the 7th grade who wanted that game and was willing to trade his copy of this for that game. Um, and I thought, sure, why not? I mean, I'm not really doing much of anything with my Game Boy Color anyway, so I took it up on the trade and I got, I got this in return, and I gotta say, that's probably one of the best trades I've ever, uh, video game trades I've ever made in my life. Because I loved playing this game on my Game Boy Color. Like, it played unlike any other Mario game I had played before, but... I mean, it just felt right on the, small sc on the Game Boy's, like, small screen. I'm, I'm not quite sure why, but... Like, Mario's sprite was small and stub stubbly like this, but... I mean, it worked for that size screen. In fact, I kind of prefer this game over its more well-loved sequel, like, partially because the proportions of everything in, in this game 
fit the screen a lot better than that game. It's... I don't know, I just really like this game. <laughs> and like, the music is really pleasant, and... Like, this is pretty... pretty comparable to some of the games you could find on like an NES at the time. And to think that you had access to that, like, in your pocket. Okay, this game must have been... really cool to, um... to people at the time. Even in its original black and white state, you know? I gotta say, this colorized version looks pretty great. Like, it... I think the... I think the, um... Graphics are a little more cartoony than they were, like, in the original. But it, it, it all fits, you know? I kind of want to put this on my, uh, Game Boy... my Game Boy um, flashcard and see like how this really looks on a on a Game Boy Advance or a Game Boy Color. See like if it Oh goodness. Sorry if I'm not really talking right now, I'm kind of just really into the game right now. Oh goodness. That was cool, I guess. Oh yeah, and this is the first game to feature Princess Daisy. Here comes, like... I guess my second favorite song of this game. The island stage... Like, the island, um... Stages... Just have, like, this really jovial theme that I really like. Yes, what's do? This is Battletoads. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that the Game Boy had good music on it, like right out of the gate. Can't kick that shell.
There we go. Playing this game, um, I think this was like the first Mario game I realized that I was probably holding down the run button too much when playing like regular Mario games because there's really no point in holding it up. Like, you run, I would say, fast enough as your default speed in this game. And like, running in this game is... There, there aren't a lot of... There aren't a lot of jumps that you need to make while running. I say, as I'm making a jump that I need to run for. It's kind of crazy how much I remember, like, where all the, um, secret areas are at. I think the only way you can get those coins, though, is, like, throwing a powerball up there and having the powerball get all those coins. Um, which you gotta do by... it from... Uh, this is kind of irritating. Mm -hmm. I think I'm wasting my time here. Uh, yeah, I'm wasting my time. kind of crazy how how far um, portable games have come since like the beginning of the Heisei era. Um, now I do pretty much the majority of my um, game playing on portable systems like on my hacked 3DS or on my hacked PSP. <laughs> Um, having a hacked portable systems, by the way, really helpful. Um, like, even the Switch is technically a portable system with a TV dock. Like, and that's probably one of the most successful um, consoles to come out of this current generation of game consoles. And to think, like, 30 years ago, this was, this was, like, the pinnacle of handheld gaming. Like, Tetris wouldn't even come out for another few months after this. Tetris for the Game Boy, I mean. So here's something that you didn't really see in, or you still don't really see in Mario games. Um, a shmup level. Um, it's anyone's guess as to why they decided these were a good idea, but like, this isn't actually, this actually isn't a bad shmup for like the other Game Boy. Um, like, there are only two, um, two levels in this game that are like this, but they're not terrible, surprisingly. And, like, you can find secrets in some of these blocks. It's just really... It's really cool how much... Nintendo was willing to kind of reinvent 
Mario. Even back then. Now, of course, being level 3 of this world, we're going to have a boss, and it's a shmup boss. just an octopus. So we've got a Moai stage over here. And then, um... The fourth world is a sort of vaguely Asiatic stage with, like, jumping Chinese vampires. Um, there's actually only four worlds all in all in this game. It's, it's pretty short, all in all. Um, there's the Powerball getting coins for us. design of this game is so much more simplistic than Super Mario Bros. 3, but everything just feels right for what the Game Boy was back at, back at its infancy. Like, even though it was, everything is just kind of a little bit off compared to what we know is like quintessential Mario. I mean, I'd go as far as to say is like the quirks of this game kind of it doesn't really make it a better game than um, some of the later like the new Super Mario Brothers games. Like it doesn't make this better than those games, but I think it makes them. It makes this game a little more interesting in my mind than. than like New Super Mario Bros. 2 or something. Like this. this was something that I knew even back in high school in like the mid 2000s when I had a. Like, back when I had a friend who would play um, New Super Mario Brothers on their DS back in high school, I'd pull out my Game Boy and play this, and, like, I wouldn't feel all that jealous of them. Even though... Even though Super, New Super Mario Brothers is, is, like, a good game in its own right, just in a different way. It didn't feel as, like, special, and good lord, I am bad at games. Um, it didn't feel as special to me as this game did. This, in all of its squished, awkward bizarreness,
Everything is so stubby and awkward, but in a really cool way. And it's kind of crazy that out of all the games that we've played tonight, like, this is probably the most... This is... This and, I guess... No. This was probably the most accessible game that we've played tonight. Um, though Military Madness is really good, too. Oh, goodness. And I do believe those rocks can kill you if they land on you. Crap. <laughs> oh. Didn't make that jump. Yeah, moving through the air in this game is kind of weird. Yeah, the rocks do kill you. I'm good at your video games. I don't know if we need any more extra lives. I also kind of love how, like, some of the bigger enemies in this game, once you squish them, they don't just disappear when they're squished. They, they disappear and then, like, comically hop off the screen. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. They could have just had them disappear in that squished state, but no, they, they get squished and then they just hop off. Why'd I go back? <laughs> okay. Okay, we're good at video games. This game also... I know Alex, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle also had pretty wonky hit detection, but I mean, at least this game has respectable 
um, level design. Oh god. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, goodness. Speaking of head injuries... I swear I'm not dying on purpose. I swear I'm not dying on purpose. Alright. Alright. Serious time. Serious time. Is there, is this a, no, it's not. Okay. Holy shit. <laughs> I think I'm just hungry. I haven't eaten dinner yet. My god, I am really not this bad at at this game, honestly. It's just streamer's curse or something. I don't know. Must be nerves. Oh god. Oh, that's good. Just kinda kicks her right back. Oh my god. Good thing I'm small Mario, otherwise that would have been a lot more difficult. Piece of cake. So, with these five lives, let's try to beat the game. This is the final world. Not Asia. Oh god, that's right. Piranha plants kind of... Oh, and those guys just don't die. You can jump on them and they just come back at you. Thank <laughs> you. 
try to... Nope. Alright. And these guys are persistent. Oh god, that's a rock. Oh no, they're not going to use these um, Koopa Zhangxi anymore <laughs> in any other future Mario games. It, it's kind of unlikely that they'd revisit anything from this game. <laughs> After this, I think it's just one more platforming level, and then another sh shmup level. Step on snake. Ah, dang it. For a second there, I thought they were going to start me back at the beginning of the level, which would have kind of sucked. just ducked. Or maybe not really, because I'm short and like there really wouldn't have been any need. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and fall into the water with the invincibility power-up, because that would be embarrassing and not cool.
Yes, it's exactly like that in Sonic, where they give you a... Oh god, why do I talk? Just kind of starting me over here. So it's a good thing Mario's short, stubby legs let him run over one space pits. Ah. All right. I think in the manual for this, these bird enemies are actually just called chickens for whatever reason. Yeah, the enemies in this game have weird names. Many of them, or I think all of them, not translated or readapted for the American release. This game is just bizarre all around. The little sparks from the balloon fight. You don't really see a lot of shmups that have invincibility things. All the coins. Uh oh. Oh, shit. Okay, we don't need a... Oh god, it... Fists? And you get killed by a... By a cloud. Lost time. Oh boy. This is gonna be fun. Oh, so there was a mushroom. That would have been great to know.
I'm good at shmups. Maybe. Oh my god, I got hit by a chicken. That really wasn't that hard. <laughs> I don't know why I had such a hard time. Oh, Daisy, Daisy, thank you, Mario. Your quest is over. And now for the actual best music in the game. Satoru Okada. Yamamoto, I don't know the guy. H. Matsuoka. Well, anyway, I think that's going to wrap it up for my stream. Um, thank you guys for listening in. Um, Amida. Who the, um, thank you for watching me play through this game. Um, and thank you for watching me play through those other uh, games from 1989. Again, games have seem to have gotten... seem to have progressed quite a bit since since the beginning of the Heisei era and yeah it's just really cool looking back and seeing how far things have got come the end anyway I'll see you guys next time I stream um and thanks for watching with me. Alright, I gotta go eat. See you guys. Bye.